Well, good morning. My name is George Moose, and uh, I have the uh, great privilege of serving as the vice chair of the board of directors of the United States Institute of Peace. And it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you uh, to the ninth event in our bipartisan congressional dialogue series. It's a platform that we created about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, for members of Congress working from opposite sides of the aisle uh, to discuss their shared concerns, shared goals, and shared priorities. And we are especially honored today to have with us two uh, foreign policy leaders in the Congress, Congressman Ed Case from Hawaii, Congressman John Rutherford from Florida, whose work on national security issues embodies that spirit of bipartisanship. Uh, this bipartisan spirit is indeed uh, something that is native, inherent to USIP, bringing people together from different viewpoints to tackle challenging national security issues. Um, it has been at the heart of US USIP's mission since our founding in 1984 by the Congress as an independent, nonpartisan national institute with a mission of reducing mitigating and resolving violent, violent conflicts abroad. Uh, I would like uh, to make a special note um, that we have with us today four representatives of the U.S. Military Academy and the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, West Point Cadets Isaac Ford and Mason Lee and Naval Academy Midshipmen Juliet O'Brien and Laura Spratling. We're delighted to have them with us uh, this summer there. These uh, future military leaders will be working alongside USIP experts to learn peace building techniques and gain practical experience that we believe will be important to them in their careers as military leaders. Uh, we're grateful for their, for their service and pleased that they could be with us this morning. Uh, the US Institute of Peace has a long uh, and uh, important role as a platform for convening policymakers, practitioners, and experts from across sectors, political viewpoints, to tackle some of the most, we have some static going on here, I'm not quite sure where it's coming from, um, to ta tackle some of the most <laughs> uh, important foreign policy issues we face as a nation. Um, it is the, that purpose that brings us together today for a discussion of China's use of economic and military coercion in the Indo-Pacific region and how to address it. Over the past decade, China has shown a growing inclination to flex its muscle uh, on the international stage, investing heavily in countries across Asia and Africa and elsewhere, and playing a more active role in regional and international conflicts. Um, since last year, the USIP has convened a series of bipartisan senior study groups to examine China's influence on conflict dynamics around the world, most recently with regard to North Korea and Burma. Uh, we are therefore especially pleased that Congressman Case and Congressman Rutherford, at their own initiative, volunteered to come to the Institute to share their views on this important issue. Uh, Representative Case, Representatives Case and Rutherford are both members of the House Appropriations Committee, and they recently traveled to uh, the Indo-Pacific, to the Philippines in particular, uh, to see firsthand the impact of China's growing influence in the region. Congressman Case uh, represents Hawaii's first district, which, given its location in the Pacific, has a, a deeply vested interest in economic and security stability in Asia. His district is also home to the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Congressman Case also has a special relationship to USIP, having worked for the late Senator Spark Matsunaga, who was the leader of congressional efforts to establish the U.S. Institute of Peace 35 years ago. Uh, let me assure you, Congressman Case, that we are honored to carry that mantle and uh, to carry forward Senator Matsunaga's commitment to building peace in the world. Congressman Rutherford represents Florida's fourth district, which is home to some of the nation's premier naval 
National Guard, and Marine Corps installations that support the United States presence in the world, but also in the Indo-Pacific. These include the Naval Air Station in Jacksonville, the Naval Station in Mayport, the Florida National Guard's 125th Fighter Wing, and the Marine Corps' Blount Island facility. Congressman Rutherford also has a long and distinguished career in public service, having spent more than four decades in law enforcement. Under his leadership, homicide and violent crime in Jacksonville dropped to a 40-year low. Uh, Congressman Case, Congressman Rutherford, we are grateful to you for being here today, and we are also pleased uh, that you have chosen USIP as a venue for uh, sharing your thoughts about this important part of the world and the challenges that the United States faces there. Um, for those of you who are following this event online, and we believe there are many of you, I want to invite you to join the uh, conversation on Twitter at, at USIP using the hashtag BipartisanUSIP. And with that, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage Congressman Case, Congressman Rutherford, um, and uh, please come enjoy it, both of us. Yes. <laughs> and let me first then invite uh, Congressman Case to offer some opening remarks, and then we will be followed by Congressman Rutherford, and then we'll have, have a moderated conversation for a few minutes before opening it up to the audience for questions. Cool. Thank you. Good morning. Morning. Aloha, as we say in Hawaii. <laughs> Happy summer solstice. Yes. Um, Ambassador, uh, Congressman, uh, honored guests, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be with you here today. And I'm especially um, honored, uh, Ambassador, that you have recognized uh, my political mentor, a U.S. Senator Spark Matsunaga. Um, I started working for then House member Spark Matsunaga 44 years ago this summer as a summer intern. And uh, he really corrupted the rest of my life because here I am 44 years later uh, representing the same district that he represented in Congress. And he had many, many interests. But one of the interests that he had was peace. Uh, and when I joined him 44 years ago, he was already well into the concept that we should have dedicated uh, institutes uh, that uh, focus on peace. Uh, he advocated for a department of peace. And over the years, uh, he continued to advocate for that as he got to the United States Senate. And in 1984, uh, he realized his dream when uh, the public law was passed that created uh, this institute. And so um, I think that he would look back on what he had conceived and would have been very, very proud. And frankly, I'm honored uh, to follow in that legacy and to be with you today. A um, couple of uh, disclaimers up front. First of all, I'm, I'm completely grateful to USIP and my colleague uh, John Rutherford for this opportunity to discuss China. But I will say up front uh, that I don't regard myself uh, in any way, shape, or form as a, quote, China expert, uh, like many of you in the audience who are. China experts who have spent your lives focusing on China uh, and are going to focus perhaps the rest of your lives if you have a career in front of you uh, on China, whether it be a military career or a diplomatic career or a not NGO career. Um, but I do pretend uh, to be one American who, uh, being born and raised in Hawaii and whose life has go goes back generations in Hawaii, and for whom Asia is all around me every day, and for whom when I am in my district, Asia is actually closer to me than is Washington, D.C. I do pretend to be an American who has focused on China uh, and Asia for a lifetime and who has lived it, really, uh, in many ways. And then I also pretend to be, of course, one member of Congress charged with the responsibility, the responsibility to make the decisions um, that are available and possible on a relationship that I believe will define our world for the next generation. So my job is to make those decisions. And so in that context, I, I think there's uh, two pieces of good news to leave with you at the very beginning. 
Uh, first of all, I consider it very good news that the interest in China inside Congress is much, much higher than it was only a decade ago. I served in Congress from 02 to 07, then I took a little 12-year hiatus. And so I remembered 02 to 07 versus now, and I can tell you that in 02 to 07, there wasn't a whole bunch of discussion of China inside Congress. Yes, many people were completely focused on it, but not across the board, not, not as a broad-based uh, concern and interest in the in the ranks of the members of Congress who are responsible for these decisions. Uh, that has uh, very much uh, changed today. China is very much uh, at the forefront of everybody's thinking. And then the second piece of good news, I hope, is demonstrated by the fact that John and I are here to talk to you. Um, and that is that um, China is a bipartisan, nonpartisan issue for the most part. I don't really sense a whole bunch of uh, deep divisions over whether China is a concern to us. Uh, we, may, we may disagree from time to time, even within our own parties, on the best way for, forward with China. But the good news is that we all agree that we need to do something about China, contrary uh, to 10, 20 years ago when either China was not particularly front and center, or if we talked about it, it was not particularly an area of agreement. <clears throat> so I do ask you to accept my remarks, both here and during the Q&A, as, as really the evolving thinking of one member which I believe is likely shared by many members. So this is what a member of Congress thinks about China. I think it's always important uh, when we get into these discussions to kind of try to dispense with some of the base questions to set the context for the discussion. Now, I realize that uh, by jumping through these base questions, I'm making some assumptions that you may disagree with. But I'm going to articulate my base questions and cut to the chase so that we can get to the discussion that follows. First of all, what does China want? I believe China wants to extend its power and influence as widely and broadly as it can. Uh, if it can get all the way to be the global hegemon, then that would be its goal. Uh, but its goal is to extend its power and influence as widely and as broadly as it can. And why is that? Because it believes that it is a matter of its renaissance as a great nation, a great power. It is its destiny. Um, what will China do to get there? Anything it can. Uh, China, if anything else, is, uh, is ruthlessly practical. Uh, it will make the decisions it can in the context of the times in which it operates uh, to get to its goal. It is not particularly, um, you, know, um, you know, handicapped by uh, concerns over democracy, for example, a pretty, pretty uh, straightforward, uh, logical decision-making that is uh, very logical and very practical. And there's good news in that because you can usually, uh, if you get into that mindset, uh, try to understand it a little bit better if maybe you don't like understanding it that way, but on the other hand, it gives you some answers to what's happening and why. What are its tools? Well, its tools are the entire toolkit, and we're here to talk to you a little bit about that toolkit. Obviously, militarily, where China is expanding its military reach as far as, far, as wide and as possible as it possibly can out into the Pacific and the Indian Oceans and beyond. Um, economic is clearly a tool. Uh, development we will talk about here today, and social cultural. Does it offer a better model to the world than democracy. That's one of the great questions of the time. What are the obstacles uh, to China's uh, goals? Well, the international rules-based order is an obstacle, at least if you uh, don't want to play by those rules. And that uh, rules-based order has served uh, our world well over the last two generations. Um, and that rules-based order is a, is a series of agreements among nations, among peoples, as to how we conduct ourselves militarily, economically, culturally, socially, um, to avoid conflict. Um, and uh, sometimes those rules get in the way, and so that's a potential obstacle. Obviously, the strength, strength of others is an obstacle, whether it be military, economic development, social, cultural, or, or the alliances that have been formed around the world. Those are obstacles. And then finally, I think we have to recognize that internal stability is an obstacle for China. We often assume <clears throat> that, um, we often make the assumption uh, that as we go out into the next couple of generations of this choice, China will always be as it is. And I don't think we can automatically make that assumption. Neither, by the way, do I think we can make that assumption as to the rest of the world, including our country. Uh, but we nonetheless have to make our best predictions, our best guesses, based on where we think this is going to be going. But we acknowledge that as an obstacle. What is China's approach um, to influence the international rules-based order uh, to its own uh, direction? Um, and or to replace the international rules-based order with a China rules-based order. And when I say that, I, I switch the hyphen from rules-based uh, to China rules, China rules-based order. Um, what is our response? Well, obviously, it's still developing. That's what we're talking about here today. How do we, how do we address, uh, how do we address uh, uh, China's uh, 
uh, goals and, and uh, means. Um, I think it, we have been slow to see the reality of China. Uh, I think we, I think we um, hoped and believed and, and thought maybe that um, extending that rules-based order uh, to China would, would, would um, incorporate it into that rules-based order and would lead to a, a more peaceful world. I think obviously uh, at this point, maybe it's not so obvious, but it's my conclusion that, that China kind of cherry-picked on that one and, and uh, uh, took the best of the rules-based order and then when it didn't like uh, constrained the constraints of that order uh, went in another direction. South China Sea would be the best example of that. Um, so we're still developing in our response, but obviously some areas are strong and must remain strong. Our military is, 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 is the best. And by our military, I mean not just the United States, but our allies in the Indo-Pacific. Anybody that has ever taken a look at the Indo-Pacific knows how well and how hard um, they work uh, to preserve um, the rules-based order in, in the Indo-Pacific and free and open uh, navigation, for example, uh, which is so important in that area. Uh, and that is a c completely compelling reason for us to continue that support. Um, our response uh, needs to be economic. Uh, I consider, just to be upfront about it, the withdrawal from the TPP to have been a mistake from that perspective. Uh, I think that we need to revisit that in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and then obviously we have um, other responses, uh, including one that we tend to overlook, which is a cultural response, because most countries in the world uh, would prefer the culture, I believe, uh, that we have offered to the world, uh, the, the democratic approach to uh, life uh, over the Chinese version, but they, will, they won't, if they have no choice, uh, take that over an insufficient response from the perspective of their own goals, which is the dilemma. What is the outcome of all of this? To be determined. It, these are choices that face us today. In fact, I would argue that, uh, that the choices that we make uh, with respect to China, as I said earlier, will determine the next two generations at least of our world, uh, how, we, how, we, um, how, we work, uh, how we work through these choices. I think our goal needs to be to accommodate uh, China's <coughs> uh, legitimate goals within, within a rules-based order internationally uh, to incorporate um, um, them and, and uh, but always from a position of strength. I think we need to pursue really a multi-approach a multi approach of, of maintaining our strength in these areas as much as we can, uh, as well as obviously, obviously always maintaining very strong and open uh, lines of communication, critical uh, to do that. And we're seeing in real time uh, with Iran the consequences of letting communication lines uh, lapse when you get to a crisis point. So with that, I've talked too long, and I'll turn this over to John and to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. And first, let me say, Ambassador, thank you. And thank you to USIP for this opportunity to come and, and share, particularly this opportunity to come and share with my good friend Ed Case from Hawaii. Uh, you know, although geographically our districts are about as far apart as you can get, still be in America. Um, we are not that far apart. And uh, our opportunity to go to uh, the Indo-Pacific and observe some of the going-ons there, I think really has uh, helped build a great relationship uh, between the two of us who are so far apart geographically. And I have to tell you, it, it, uh, you know, as Ed said, I'm not a... Uh, I'm not a China expert, I'm not an Indo-Pacific expert, uh, but I will give you, as Ed uh, described, the, the view of uh, someone who has spent, you know, I spent 41 years of my life uh, protecting the hometown as a police officer and then as a sheriff, and, uh, and that was a tremendous calling. And, and opportunity. And, and now it's an honor to be in Congress and now have this opportunity uh, to protect the homeland. Uh, and uh, trust me, it won't be for 41 years. <laughs> but, uh, but it is a, a, a tremendous opportunity. And uh, on our recent tour of Southeast Asia and the Pacific with military leaders, uh, I have to tell you, I was alarmed at, uh, at what I saw. Uh, China is 
tightening their grip um, on our allies in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, China is a true peer adversary, I believe. Uh, I'm, I have great concern for our ability, the military, uh, to be able to do their job uh, against such a formidable peer adversary. Uh, just this week, the Wall Street Journal had an article uh, detailing how China and Russia are attempting to move into Afghanistan as we, as we withdraw. In the South, in South and Central America, China continues to make strategic investments causing instability and increasing China's resources and power. At an opportunity, I was, I was amazed. I, I had a Codel down to South America and went to Suriname and Guyana. And I was quite surprised that the Chinese had already been there. And I suspect that a lot of their attention to South America is the fact that an oil reserve of 44 billion barrels has been located off the coast of Guyana. And so they uh, truly see opportunity in South America. And they are building a peer military power that threatens to compete with our armed, American armed forces. Uh, and as one who believes strongly in President Reagan's uh, statement that peace through strength I think is uh, very, very important to, to keep in mind. And I, I know in the Indo-Pacific when we had a briefing from Admiral Davidson, um, I, I, was, I was amazed to see the imbalance of military power in the South Pacific. Uh, their surface vessels were already I'm not talking about 2025, which there's some even more amazing projections. I'm sorry, 2045. Uh, but today, they have three times the surface vessels that we have. They have five times the subsurface vessels that we have. Three to four times the number of aircraft that we have. And one of the statements uh, that concerned me most was when the Admiral said, yet we have the technological advantage. And, and you know, being a bit of a World War II buff, you know, one of the things that concerned me about that statement was that was exactly the way the Axis powers felt, not uh, Germany particularly, uh, that they had the best technology, and they did. They had the best planes, the best ships, the best uh, artillery, had the best of everything. What they didn't have was the industrial might of the United States. They couldn't shoot us down quick enough, they couldn't sink us quick enough to win the war. I fear we're making the same mistake that Germany may have made in World War II, and that was an over-reliance on technology. They're also, the Chinese are also stealing our intellectual property uh, and planting their flag around the world. I'm sure you've all heard of the Road and Belt Initiative and the scary part about this is how quiet they are about it. Most folks I talk to who haven't studied the issue specifically are shocked when they discover China's quiet aggression in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I, 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 as many of you know, China is methodical, if nothing else. They learn from their mistakes, and they have the type of political system which allows them to work for the long game. If you look at the Belt and Road Initiative that I mentioned earlier, 
they are planning a future where Chinese, not U.S. leadership, is assumed. We as a nation and as a Congress uh, have to understand how this would change the core underpinnings of our global structure uh, and norms of contact, uh, conduct. China has even gone into the developing nations of Africa and Asia to buy influence from governments uh, who are desperate for the financial support that China is willing to provide. That's why they were in South America, going to Suriname and Guyana and these other, other areas. Some of these countries have no other option if not the United States. And that's why it's important to have dialogues like this to show our allies in the developing world that the U.S. is ready to take on these challenges. During our trip, I made certain that everyone that I spoke to understood that I believe when the president says America first, he does not mean America alone. But we have to make sure that America is strong economically, that we're strong militarily, and that we are aggressive with our uh, uh, efforts to influence throughout the country or throughout the globe, winning hearts and hearts and minds. And and I believe that um, the U.S. Uh, IP plays a key role in raising that awareness, which is one of the many reasons I, I support this organization strongly. And again, I want to thank you for having us here today so that we can uh, discuss more our, our conclusions from our trip abroad. Thank you. Thank you both for setting the table for a conversation that could go on for much longer than the time that we have allowed to ourselves. But building, uh, Congressman, on the last point that you've made, I'd, I'd like to start by asking you, Congressman Case, um, in your testimony in April uh, on the National Defense Authorization Act, you, you said, and I'm quoting here, and that even with increased investment in improving our military posture in the Indo-Pacific, the U.S. cannot go it alone in the region. Uh, uh, peacefully integrating China into a, the existing rules-based regional order, which you talked about, uh, requires the active cooperation of partners and countries. Could, could you say a bit more about what you think the U.S. approach should be in the region beyond, um, obviously, the, the, the importance of maintaining a strong military posture. Sure. I mean, uh, we are not going to address China over the long term alone. Um, that's what John just said. Um, I think that we all, um, on that congressional delegation, and all of us, I think, independently, know and feel that uh, the days when the United States can simply snap its fingers around the world and things will happen magically, um, those days, you know, are for the most part um, either unwise to depend on um, or in some cases um, over. And uh, we have to work on our partnerships around the world. And, you know, we have alliances um, in, in Asia. Uh, we have uh, great alliance, alliance partners, but and we tend to focus on our alliance partners um, and some of them are incredibly strong. Japan has been an incredible alliance partner from, from the perspective of an international rules-based order um, and constructive <coughs> engagement with China. So that's a very positive uh, 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 one. I, I think uh, you know, Australia needs to be noted as an incredible partner uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, but we only have five alliance partners, uh, but we have a lot of friends and potential friends. Um, and some of the most notable ones, uh, Singapore, mm -hmm. is not technically an alliance partner, and yet, uh, for all intents and purposes, it functions as one. We both uh, met uh, with our con congressional delegation, with the top leadership of Singapore, and, um, you know, all of these countries are in a very difficult, difficult situation, where they are, uh, their largest economic partner is China which, of course, China wants to foster, but their largest strategic and defense partner is the United States. So imagine that you're that country. That puts you in a little bit of a bind. 
Um, Australia, same thing. Um, you know, I could go right down the list. Vietnam, to some extent, the same thing. But they want to align with us. They want to be our strategic partner. They don't like um, having to be put to this choice. And they certainly don't like to be in a situation. They don't want to get to a situation where they're both the largest economic partner and the primary strategic partner. And, you know, and uh, you know, China is their biggest defender in the world. That's not where they're trying to go. We have to realize that. We have been um, inconsistent, I believe, um, in, our, in, our, in our focus on those alliances and on those friendships. <clears throat> so the alliances need a lot more strengthening. Some of them are, are not doing as well as others. The Philippines, for example, is our alliance partner, and yet uh, a, a pretty inconsistent you know, response from, from the China perspective with the Philippines. Um, it needs a little more attention from us, and that's probably why one of the reasons why it, it has you know flirted a little bit more with China. But let's not forget about countries like you know Vietnam, uh, which inside a couple of generations has become a pretty strong uh, um, you know a partner of ours in many ways. Certainly does not want to fall under China's uh, uh, spell, uh, and then um, uh, partners that um, want to, and I believe we need to recognize, need to remain. Uh, independent, but, but nonetheless have the same concerns. And in that department, I would put India at the top of my list. Uh, so we, and fundamentally, if we approach this just the United States trying to project our ourselves out there militarily, culturally, economically, you know, first of all, um, we probably don't have the capability to do that, at least on a sustained basis over time, given our commitments to the rest of the world as well. But second, we don't have to and we shouldn't. We should look for those friends and we should foster those, uh, foster those uh, strengths that we already have and, and think of ways to strengthen uh, the countries and, and places in our world uh, that um, are very concerned about the, the division of the world into an international rules-based order and a China rules-based order. <clears throat> Rutherford, just sort of building, I think, in, in a way on that. We, as, you, as you know, in early June, top uh, international security officials from 20 um, Asia-Pacific nations met in Singapore mm -hmm. um, to talk about the state of the region. And our delegation, of course, is rep represented by Acting Secretary of Defense uh, uh, Shanahan. Um, um, the commentaries coming out of that meeting were that the U.S. talked a very good game about our strategy and our approach. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> participants were much more focused on the very tough line taken by senior Chinese officials in the course of that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And of course, that tough line has also been reflected in tough actions that the Chinese have been taking in the region. You mentioned Vietnam. I happened to be there about four years ago. And already, we talk a lot about the South, the end of the, uh, the uh, 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 South China Sea. But there's an awful lot of activity going on in Southeast Asia, particularly given China's dominance of the Mekong River. Um, what is it we need to do to make more credible our intentions with regard to maintaining a strong posture and presence in, in the Indo-Pacific? What, what are the kinds of actions that you think our <clears throat> government, our administration ought to be thinking about as part of that strategy? Well, I think... Um, I think the key to, to the Indo-Pacific area, and particularly in response to the military and economic coercion that you see uh, throughout the region from China, uh, it requires that we become much more <clears throat> aggressive in our uh, desire to have bilateral uh, trade agreements with our our partners, uh, the, the we are still the partner of choice in that region, I believe. Um, but they are beginning to question our resolve and, and whether we truly will be there for them. And, um, you know, I, I sort of think we took our eye off the ball in that region, um, focused too much on, well, maybe not too much, but I shouldn't say that, but, but the focus shifted to the Middle East. <clears throat> and I believe now we need to focus back on what's going on uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And when you look at, uh, Congressman uh, uh, Case mentioned the, the Singapore mm -hmm. and how they are trying to walk that fine line and not make a choice between the United States and, mm -hmm. and China. Um, we, we need to be sure that we are uh, 
economically uh, and diplomatically assuring those individuals that we are there for them. And uh, I, I, you know, when 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 I look at the Philippines, uh, when we traveled to the Philippines, I was quite concerned. Uh, first of all, I thought it was interesting that that an American delegation goes to the country and we did not meet a single high-ranking governmental official in the Philippines. Mm. That concerned me. Now, the president was over visiting President Xi in China, so I, I understand that. And, and they did have a, uh, an earthquake up in uh, Luzon, but uh, I'm, I'm really concerned, and, and I will tell you, uh, when you look at <clears throat> What's going on with Subic Bay? Uh, I think that's going to be the telltale sign for the Philippines, uh, because while, while we were there, we're looking at we're looking at Subic Bay, and the the military, I should say, in the Philippines is very close to the American military, very close. Uh, but I have great concern about the president, who. They are in the process right now of leasing and, or selling Subic Bay in the shipyard to either a Chinese consortium or an American consortium. Mm -hmm. And our diplomat there believes that we still have preferred member staff <coughs> that want to do business with us. Uh, so I think the telltale sign is going to be what happens in Subic Bay. That will give us a greater indicator of uh, what direction we're going to see the Philippines go. And um, I, I'll close with this uh, on this question. I, I, I think we rely too much on carrier task force diplomacy. Uh, I think we need the Clark base, the Clark Airfields. We need the Subic Bays. Uh, we need to have a presence, I believe, uh, on the ground and uh, helping with the economy of these countries, uh, particularly those like the Philippines that have a, a, a real tendency, I think, toward China. Well, thank you. I, I, have, uh, I have a whole raft of questions I would love to ask, but we promised <clears throat> our audience we give, would give them a chance to, uh, to pose their questions, and we also will may be getting some that are coming to us from, from our, uh, those who are viewing following this online. So let me open it to, yes, I see hand right here in the middle row. That's, yes, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, please introduce yourselves briefly and make your questions brief. I'll try to make it brief. Um, Mark Miller, uh, international trade advisor, mostly focusing on Central Asia. Um, countries like uh, the Central Asian Caucasus countries want U.S. investment and assistance, and they understand that the Belt and Road Initiative does come with a price tag, uh, it ultimately, in some cases, threatening their sovereignty. Um, however, for many of these countries, Belt and Road Initiative is the only game in town. So, um, and goes, goes beyond funding, technical assistance, relationship building, international standards. What could be done to encourage these countries to avoid being well overwhelmed by the Belt and Road Initiative? What U.S. programs, what U.S. initiative, as well as European initiatives, um, can be effectively and consistently, Congressman, you mentioned the consistency, uh, consistently applied so these countries look to the West uh, for leadership and for long-term development assistance. Thank you. Let me let me just simply validate that question since I just returned from Central Asia three weeks ago and, and found exactly that. that it's, it's clear the, uh, the effort that Chinese are making to assert their influence, economic and, and other, in the region and the apprehension that the countries in the region right. have about the fact that, you know, uh, how, the, how that is impacting their freedom of choice with regard to their own policies. Who wants to start off on yeah, that? Uh, Go ahead. Well, well I'll, I'll start uh, with the answer. And, and I have to tell you, I, I think the, the answer is we, we really must step up diplomatically uh, in, these, in these areas where they, they don't feel they have an, uh, another opportunity. Um, you, you know, I, I think Secretary Mattis 
said it best when he said, if you're going to cut the State Department, <laughs> find me more bullets. Uh, I, I think he was absolutely right. We quote him often. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I do as well, because I, I think he's spot on with, with that analogy. At the same time, we need to start uh, bringing light to uh, the economic coercion that China is using throughout the world. Most, most folks have no idea uh, how bad it is and, and actually what the, what the Chinese are doing, not just in, in tariffs, those, those people see. What you don't see are the, are the non-tariff uh, barriers to imports and exports that they do. For example, uh, when, when South Korea put the THAAD um, missiles in, China responded very aggressively. But nobody saw it because what they did was the company that provided the land in South Korea for those missile sites actually had um, like little convenience stores inside of China. They're all, they're all gone now because they, they ran them out of business by, uh, by saying they, were, they had fire, violation, fire code violations and other things. <coughs> Nothing to do with, with you know, what you would typically think. They put tariffs on them or something like that. It, it's these regulatory uh, methods that they use to really harm these companies. And, and unless you are really on the inside, you're not going to see what's going on there. Do you want to? <clears throat> sure. Well, I think uh, I agree with uh, Congressman Rutherford. Uh, first of all, um, I, I believe that the, um, the, the reductions in the State Department over the last couple of years or longer need to be reversed in the big time. So uh, I think diplomacy needs to return to the forefront, number one. Number two, we forget about um, the, the uh, credibility and validity of our soft power when we do project it. So these are areas, for example, the Peace Corps. Uh, to bring the Peace Corps back. Uh, the Peace Corps, you know, we have forgotten uh, the incredible contributions of the Peace Corps to, to, our, to, to the world um, over the last uh, half century. Um, and so, you know, many countries uh, that are directly in the line of fire, so to speak, are, we don't have Peace Corps there anymore. Why not? Uh, not only is that good for those countries, but uh, I think it's good for the world. So that's number two. Number three, in terms of Belt and, uh, you know, Belt and Road and uh, economic coercion, completely agree again with the analysis. Again, China, ruthlessly practical. This isn't just about the redevelopment of those countries. It's about dependence. It's about a, a military option. So when China goes around the world helping countries build ports, mm -hmm. do you think it's only to build ports for those countries? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Build airfields? I don't think so. So, you know, what do we do about that? Because you're correct that those countries, in many cases, have no practical choice because the, 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 um, the, the, the means and the, the, the approaches that were taken uh, consistently since the Second World War to offer development assistance throughout much of the world are, are lapsing, number one. And number two, the needs are so much more overwhelming. And China holds out that carrot and says, I'm the only game in town. You're one of those countries. It's a hard it's a hard deal to turn down. Uh, now, query whether that's sustainable on China's part. Uh, obviously, they've had problems with the Belt and Road, as they've, as they've said so themselves. And they have actually looked for partners from the rest of the world uh, to come in and help them out with this in, in cases. And so I think that's a sign that maybe they can't pull this off forever and ever. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be out there doing it. So in that category, uh, I think we've got a lot of eggs in the basket of the Build Act and whether we can make that work. Um, and, you know, we're obviously way early in the implementation of the BUILD Act, but we have essentially said this is our response. So can we make that work or not? Um, I think parts of it can work very, very well um, if we sustain it, if we fund it, um, and if we back it up. Um, there are parts of the BUILD Act that I think still leave big, big holes in what countries need. For example, for example, infrastructure projects for which there's no real economic return. Mm -hmm. right. um, those are gaps still. And I will close by um, um, emphasizing one thing you said, which is us with our European partners. And I would broaden that, by the way, uh, to say uh, other countries like Japan, which is very, very much focused on, on uh, foreign investment and development assistance, <clears throat> not not only because they think it's the right thing to do in the world, but because for them it's part of their basic strategy of maintaining independence. 
uh, from China over time. And so we need uh, to be partnering with the rest of the world in order to develop a credible alternative uh, to what China has offered, even if China's offer is an imperfect one with a lot of strings. Other questions? Yes, over here on the, on the right. Hi, Isabella Paternostro, Department of State, Bureau of East Asia Pacific Affairs. So how does the U.S. Congress planning to address China's uh, military coercion and balance them, per se, without risking our economic ties and isolating the Chinese Americans who live here in the U.S.? That's an excellent question. You anticipated my closing question, but, it's, but it, it put it in a bit of a broader context. I mean, we have our agenda with China is <laughs> deep and complex. Uh, we have issues of economics and trade. We have issues of security. Uh, we have issues of uh, China's uh, increasingly re repressive behavior inside of China. How do we sort through this complicated agenda? How do we do, well, first of all, can do, do all of these things? First of all, we commit to sorting through it. I think we practiced uh, you know, denial, uh, denial approach for, mm -hmm. for about half a generation here. And unfortunately, reality has caught up with our denials, uh, mm -hmm. which is good. I'm happy it happened now rather than uh, after another half generation. Um, your point about uh, Chinese Americans, uh, frankly, I, I, I sense absolutely no, uh, um, 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 you know, disagreement with Chinese Americans with the overall concern with China uh, and with uh, the direction that our country um, uh, has to take. So I don't share that um, uh, concern. I think Chinese Americans understand perfectly what's at stake here and, and want our country uh, to, to succeed and prosper in the world. Um, I think that um, we've already ticked off a couple of the things we have to, first of all, absolutely, we have to maintain our military strength um, and partner with other countries in the region on, on strong military. Our ties with countries like Australia need to be maintained and strengthened. Uh, John is exactly right on the Philippines. We need to make sure that relationship goes well. That's key to a lot of this. Uh, I already talked about new military alliances. But again, the, the, um, the projection of, of, of other uh, forms of, of, of influence into the region needs to be returned diplomatic, economic, um, cultural, social, across the board. We've got to take a really uh, cohesive over, overall approach. Uh, not any one of these areas is going to work over time. It really has to be all of these areas at one time. Perhaps building on that, how, how is the, what's the role of the Congress in, in, in sort of helping bring together this sense of a coherent strategy? I think one of the one of the best approaches that Congress can take mm. is to sh is to shine the light on the problem. Mm. As, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think this has happened very quietly over the last 20 years. Uh, state and uh, uh, state and foreign uh, affairs ought to be. Uh, we should be holding hearings, mm. bringing people in shedding light on what's going on economically and militarily. Mm -hmm. uh, sh particularly, I think it's important that we start to collect some of, the, some of the economic data so that when we go to our allies and, and others who are being approached by China for the One Belt, One Road, mm -hmm. we can actually show them some empirical data that shows that's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at what happened in Sri Lanka, that should never happen again, anywhere. And, and I've, I fear that, uh, that it will. And, and so I think a couple things that we can do is gather the data and then make it known to, to the world exactly what's going on. Let me take one more question right here, and then maybe we'll have time just to allow each uh, of our speakers to wrap up. Yes, Thank please. you. My name is Hamna, and I am from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, going back to the idea of the Belt and Road Initiative, especially the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, mm. which is the foundation of the Belt and Road Initiative, mm. being from Pakistan, I do see the effects of the Chinese influence within my country, not only economic effects through development, but also social and political influence. Mm. My question is born out of concern because a lot of Pakistanis support China, this Chinese development and Chinese political inclusion as a retaliation to the United States mm -hmm. and because of the drone strikes we've had and our, generally our relation with the United States has been um, very problematic in the past 
few decades at least, especially after the Afghan war. Um, my question is that how can the United States bring Chinese allies on the table, such as Pakistan, mm. and make them feel like they're also, that the US has better intentions for them than China does? Yeah. There's another relationship that is fraught with complexity, our relationship with Pakistan. And, mm -hmm. But it figures very prominently in this whole conversation about how, how do we, um, at the one time, uh, strengthen these relationships with key partners in the region, even when we have some significant issues <laughs> well, I, in I, our, I, our relationship. I'm sorry, John, you want to go? Oh, go ahead. I think you have to leave the door open and the lights on, for starters. Yeah. Um, you know, history, history has a way of surprising you. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to uh, be open to opportunities. Uh, the, the U.S. relationship <coughs> with Pakistan has been a troubled one, and I regret that as one member of Congress. I don't see any reason why we should have that relationship with Pakistan. Um, you know, obviously it has to do with, you know, regional uh, differences in India-Pakistan rivalries and, and you know, <clears throat> past, um, you know, alleged wrongdoings by any one of a number of countries. Uh, so if we're going to live in that past, then it's going to be hard to get over that. But if we... I believe that Pakistan uh, does not want to be dependent upon China. Um, I believe that Pakistan does want a relationship with the United States, uh, and that's a pretty good starting point for a better relationship. Um, after that, it's hard work, because obviously Pakistan, like many other uh, countries, although not in the same dire straits as many countries that absolutely have no choice but to accept uh, Chinese um, um, offers if they have no alternative, uh, Pakistan has its own resources, obviously a, a great country in its own right with a lot of you know, economic uh, ability and potential. Uh, nonetheless, um, everything that I said about, uh, um, you know, the choices that we face with China applies to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, um, I think it just needs a lot of work, mm -hmm. but I would be optimistic on that if that work was devoted uh, on both sides. I'll take that as a clear plug for renewed and reinforced diplomacy for the, for the entire region. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Congressman, you, did you want to respond to that at all? I, I would just go back and add uh, what I mentioned earlier, and, and that is I think the importance of of educating uh, Pakistan and ourselves, quite frankly, because I'm not sure how many Americans really understand the coercive uh, nature that China is, is employing through all these relationships. And, and I think the best thing that we can do, and, and I, I think Congressman Case is absolutely right, let's, let's talk a little history. Let's talk about some very recent history. Hmm. And, and what has China done uh, with the relationships that they've that they've already built, and, and that they're uh, folks that they're dealing with now? And when when you see what what uh, they've done with Japan, with South Korea, with uh, Taiwan, what they want to do in in Hong Kong, uh, what they're doing in the South China Sea, uh, I, I think the more we illuminate hmm. for. Uh, their potential partners, the more they'll understand uh, that that's that they're bad actors, and that's not necessarily a good way to uh, to to address the issues that they have internally, and that it would be that, that and and I think it also goes to a, a cultural sale. You know, one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, I think, for, as an American, is the fact that we truly go in. Uh, so people can have freedom. We, we don't want to rule their country, run their country, occupy their land. That's, that's not our mission. Uh, I, I don't see America going in and taking a, you know, a Sri Lanka port, <laughs> you, you know, because they can't pay their bill. Those, so I, I, I think the more we can illuminate the strategy that China has, I, I think fewer and fewer people will be drawn in by it. And as you pointed out, it, uh, that this uh, aggressive China's Chinese behavior extends well beyond that. You talked about Latin America. I have, mm -hmm. uh, since I, most of my time has been spent in Africa, I see it very, very evidently in Chinese activities there and regrets on the part of many African countries about some of the deals into which they have entered and only belatedly have realized what some of the implications and consequences are. So the idea of illuminating the consequences and the implications mm -hmm. of these things, I think, is very important. I guess we, we sort of 
have come to our last minute here, and I, I, I got wanted, since you're both uh, members of the Appropriations Committee, um, I wonder from that perspective whether are there are particular initiatives or ideas that you believe uh, can be proposed or or uh, further through your work in the Appropriations Committee that would go to some of the elements of your your, your strategy for how the U.S. ought to be approaching, approaching the region. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I believe there is. And, you know, I, I would focus uh, and try to get my colleagues to focus, and I think we are, mm -hmm. on, on the issues of, uh, you know, building up our military. Uh, folks, our military uh, is, is, has been in pretty bad shape. Uh, Secretary Mattis said out of 31 mili Army brigades, huh. five can fight tonight. Now, I think that's improved over the last couple of years, but five can fight tonight. That means they have all of the equipment, the training, the support that they need to be successful on the battlefield. Uh, not because we want to use that military huh. might, but because with that military might and with our economic might, we are much more effective diplomatically because we're able to assist our partners uh, instead of leaving them to, uh, you know, China's influence. And so I, I, I think we have to focus on our, our, our military, our economy, and our diplomacy and sell our culture around the globe. Uh, because I think that's why we are the preferred partner uh, for most of the globe. Congressman Case, I think you get the last word. Um, well, I think I think a a, a, a starter here and an, and an absolute is a strong military in the Indo-Pacific. Hmm. Uh, and by the Indo-Pacific, we are talking about Indo-Pacific Command, which stretches from right off the coast of hmm. California all the oh, way um, into the western um, half of the Indian Ocean. Hmm. Uh, that is the, um, you know, the sphere that China uh, plays in, lives in, plays in, and <coughs> that's the sphere where a lot of these choices are going to be made, whether it's, you know, closing down the Straits of Malacca or keeping them open or, or you know, having to navigate, you know, outside of uh, the Philippines, to, you know, to get goods to Japan as opposed to the South China Sea. Uh, those, are, those are absolute, um, you know, <laughs> must-haves. Uh, but if we only put our, and I, th I think John said this, if we put, only put our eggs in that basket, we're not going to make it here. We're going to have to, we, we do have to start to, again, to fund the institutions of our government that were non-military influencers um, out there. And, and that's where China, frankly, perceives our weakness uh, right now, is in, is in, a, in, a, is in a failure of, of commitment to, to diplomacy, to, to um, you know, as I say again, soft power, whether it be the Peace Corps or anything else. Um, uh, the State Department itself, uh, whether we have sufficient folks in our embassies, whether we have sufficient embassies and consulates, whether we have sufficient projection into many of these countries. Uh, uh, and then finally, um, 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 economic assistance. Uh, uh, both funding some of the old brands of economic assistance that have tended to fall by the wayside, but also, again, building on the Build Act, making sure that works and mm -hmm. filling in, in the holes in that uh, where, um, where, again, China uh, senses as uh, senses weakness. So those are the areas that we have to put our money into, um, and this is this is cost benefit stuff um, because it is going to cost a lot of money to do all of this. Uh, but the cost of not doing this, uh, you know, 10 years from now, or 15 years from now, or 20 years from now, is a is a factor of uh, complete multipliers over what the investment is today. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank. Both of you, Congressman Rutherford, yeah. Congressman Case, for first and foremost taking the initiative to come here to present your views, but importantly to present them in a, in a bipartisan way, which I think for us is encouraging in, in, in the sense that an understanding that there, there are shared concerns and shared uh, views about how we should be addressing what, I, what is clearly one of the major challenges that the United States faces in terms of its foreign policy. So please join me in thanking uh, our two speakers this morning for their presentations and their Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you.